All right, good evening, everybody. Welcome to another edition of In the Cosmos, the uh, International Observe the Moon Night edition of In the, uh, of In the Cosmos. I'm here from the De Anza College Planetarium, and with me, as always, is my good friend, Mike Askins. Mike, go ahead and wave. I know it's a little dark where you are there, but that's good for telescopes, bad for seeing you. Yeah, thanks, Toshi. Uh, it's uh, nice to be with you tonight. And uh, the moon is very nice and bright out there tonight. Got a couple of planets, too. I think it'll be a great night. All right. Well, uh, we get a little preview of the, what we're going to be taking a look at later on here. We've got uh, myself and Mike here, uh, as well as the moon. And of course, we'll focus in uh, on the moon here and uh, hopefully get a chance to take a look at some other things uh, as well. Um, but I do want to acknowledge here that uh, tonight uh, we're actually a, um, it's sort of an auspicious night insofar as we are about six months away from the 50th anniversary of one of the Apollo missions here. So let me go and uh, bring that up here. Apollo 16, um, which some of our viewers uh, may have, may remember uh, when this launched, but this launched in April, on April 6, April 16th, 1972. Uh, and it was the penultimate mission uh, to the moon that was uh, part of the Apollo set of missions that launched in this late 60s and early 70s here. So in six months, we'll be celebrating the 50th anniversary of that mission and then we'll have one more 50th celebration uh, for the Apollo missions when uh, we get to the 50th anniversary of Apollo 17. But uh, Mike, any particular memories that you have of, uh, uh, of the Apollo missions here that you'd like to share? Um, it was very exciting and um, I, I pause when I think about how long ago it was though, Toshi. So maybe I don't want to be too clear about uh, how many things I remember there, but uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. And of course, what's fair, what's also fun is it turns out that uh, we're we are planning on going back to the moon fairly soon. We are. Uh, NASA has a set of uh, NASA has a set of missions scheduled to do that, and those will be covered under the Artemis mission. And of course, Artemis, if you know your mythology, Artemis and Apollo are related. That was a very intentional choice by NASA to choose uh, those names, but more on that perhaps a little bit later on. Uh, as I said, we're going to go ahead and focus on the moon. But before that, um, we do want to take a look just at the evening sky and see what sort of things we're uh, taking a look at and get ourselves situated here. So I'm going to switch over to our Stellarium program here, which is uh, allows us to simulate the sky. And this is uh, sort of a real-time simulation of the view from Cupertino, where, of course, the planetarium is located. Uh, but uh, we're looking towards the western part of the sky. If you have a clear view over towards the west, in particular towards the southwest, uh, very low in the sky is a planet, a very bright object there. That's the planet Venus. And just below that is a star called Antares, um, which is in the constellation of uh, Scorpius, uh, the scorpion here. So we can turn on all the constellations uh, for a moment here, but just focusing in on Venus, it's right in Scorpius. But again, getting very, very low. Scorpius, of course, the scorpion, very low over in the west, uh, southwestern part of the sky. I know where I am. I have a, my view of the southwest is kind of blocked here, but if you have a clear enough shot, uh, you can see Venus very low in the sky. It's a little bit easier to see earlier in the evening, um, but then, of course, it's also not quite as dark uh, at that time as well. So, um, Yeah, I can't really see that, Toshi. That's pretty low for me. Yeah, it's pretty getting pretty low in the sky, and Venus, is unfortunately, is going to stay pretty low in the sky for the foreseeable future here. So, um, so Venus mm -hmm. will be out there, so if you're taking a look and you see uh, a bright thing, uh, it might be Venus. Again, you'll want to be looking pretty low. And notice also that uh, compared to Antares here, uh, Venus is not twinkling, at least in the simulation, in Antares here twinkling quite a bit. Actually uh, enhance the twinkling because it looks pretty uh, in Stellarium here. But uh, true to form, when you look at planets in the sky, they twinkle considerably less than stars in the sky. And that's one way to tell whether you're looking at a planet versus a star is planets will twinkle much less. So that's something that you can take a look for. Um, but the moon, of course, is a little bit further on in the sky. As we pan a little bit more towards the south, uh, we're looking, uh, there's a couple of bright things near the moon. The moon, of course, here off on the left uh, in my view here. And to the right of the moon, there's Jupiter, which should appear fairly bright in the sky. And a little bit further to the right from Jupiter, 
is where Saturn is. And Saturn, of course, isn't all that bright. And uh, Mike, as you look at Jupiter and Saturn in the sky, how would you compare the brightness of Saturn? Is it like half the brightness or uh, not quite that? Or how would you compare that? I'd say it's, um, well, Jupiter is pretty dazzling, actually. Not as bright as the moon, of course. But uh, I'd say uh, two or three times dimmer. Um, but it's hard for me to judge time's dimness, Toshi. <laughs> But uh, I would have to say that, um, let me take a look there. Usually I can tell the difference between Jupiter and Saturn because of the color. Um, Jupiter tends to be fairly whitish and um, Saturn a little more yellowish. But uh, for me, it's uh, a little bit to the right, about the same altitude in the sky. So I think people will be able to spot, spot them pretty easily. Yeah, they're uh, just based on what I can see in Stellarium. Of course, I'm inside. I can't enjoy any of these lovely views. Hopefully some of the folks <laughs> watching here are outside enjoying the view. But if you go outside, they're kind of the only bright things in that part of the sky. There's some brighter things a bit further away. Um, but uh, again, the moon, just looking to the, uh, to the right of the moon, that bright thing will be Jupiter. And the less bright thing, that'll be Saturn. Again, you might notice if you look carefully, if you're looking at the real sky, Jupiter and Saturn not twinkling very much especially compared to these uh, other bright stars that are nearby. Um, now, Toshi, of, yeah. I, I did look up um, the fact that uh, if, if you were to look with uh, Stellarium, it says that Saturn is about twice as far away tonight from us as, as Jupiter is. So it's not just that Saturn is a little smaller, a little less surface area to reflect with, but it's also um, twice as far away. Yeah, it's considerably farther away. Um, and so the two of them, so they do have a four, difference in brightness there. And at least by four times, I suppose, right, Toshi? Yeah, it's it's pretty far out there. In fact, Jupiter, uh, well, Earth, let me back up. Earth, of course, takes one year to go around the sun. Jupiter takes about 12 years to go around the sun. So if anybody watching our broadcast here is 12 years old, you would be one Jupiter year old. <laughs> uh, but Saturn uh, takes nearly 30 years to go once around the sun. So if you wanna feel young, you can always give your age in terms of Saturn years, as opposed to, uh, as opposed to Earth years there. And you can divide your age by 30 years, you can save some years there, but uh, uh, both uh, brilliant in the sky. And maybe we'll get a chance to take a look at them through the scope a little bit later on. Um, I do wanna note just briefly, of course, if you look uh, almost straight up from where Saturn and Jupiter are, there are three, uh, very bright stars there in the sky. And uh, let me go ahead and turn on my star labels. So we've got Vega here, and I'm going to zoom in just a little bit to get those other stars to show up. We've got Vega, which is um, the brightest of the two. And then to the left of Vega is Deneb. And then we have Altair. And those three stars, they're pretty bright in the sky, and they form what's called the Summer Triangle. And you may note, of course, it's not summertime right now. Today, it kind of felt like summertime, but it's not actually summertime. But we call it the it's Great here. Summer Triangle because we first see this triangle rising in the evening in the early uh, early summer evenings. Uh, in the fall, uh, when uh, night falls, then we see this triangle almost directly overhead, and then it sets fairly soon after sunset here. But uh, so can still see the Summer Triangle, even though it isn't summertime right now. Now you've got another uh, another uh, very large geometrical object uh, that's a little bit further east, right, Toshi? Uh, I do. There's several uh, objects there, or several sort of asterisms uh, that are uh, out there, um, and uh, I think you're probably talking about the Great Square of Pegasus. Um, that's which, the one I was thinking. Yeah, so Pegasus is out there uh, as well, and that's made of uh, these. And go ahead and put on the uh, the constellation work here. It's made of these four stars over here. So let me sort of pan down and zoom in just a little bit more so the moon's not quite as bright. But these four stars here, they make up the great square. And that's the great square of Pegasus, the flying horse. If Again, if you know your mythology, Pegasus was the horse with wings. And so there we see that the great square makes up the main body of the horse there in the sky. So those are a few shapes that you can look for uh, in the evening as we're enjoying the moon uh, as well. The great square up there, and then the great triangle a little bit higher, almost directly overhead in the sky here. 
Um, but of course, our focus tonight being International Observe the Moon Night is the moon uh, itself here. So why don't we go ahead and we'll, uh, I will focus in and zoom in with Stellarium here to get a chance to see what sort of features we might see. Uh, we see these darker areas on the moon and we see some craters on the moon, the darker areas. Those are called Maria. Those are ancient lava flows on the moon where when the moon was quite young, there was lava flowing on the moon. And if you've ever been to Hawaii or some other place that has lava or volcanoes and you see, you've seen lava flowing when it flows and cools, it becomes a dark colored rock. And that's what we see as the darker colored rock on the moon. And then we have places that make the moon kind of look like Swiss cheese, places where holes have formed because things have crashed into the moon. And those are craters on the moon there. Uh, so we'll be taking a look at some of the Maria and some of the uh, craters uh, on the moon. Unfortunately, it's not the best night for observing the moon because the moon is in what we call a gibbous phase. And that's when the moon looks like it's more than half a circle, but less than a complete circle there. And so it makes the moon quite bright, uh, as I'm sure Mike has noticed with his own view through the telescope. It's quite bright through the telescope. Normally, you can uh, you try to stop that down a little bit because it, it is so bright and it can't hurt your eyes for looking at it. Um, not that it, you would uh, damage your eyes. It's just a little painful to have a, a bright thing shining right in your eyes. So uh, luckily, Mike doesn't have to do that tonight. No, but um, it is true, Toshi. Normally, when we take a look at the moon, we try to time things so that we look ar around the first quarter moon. And that's because um, the contrast um, between night and day on the moon allows you to see uh, a little more a little more um, detail than you might be able to see when it's more fully lit up like it is tonight. It's only four days, I think, away from full. Yeah, so, so it's, uh, uh, we're getting pretty close to the full moon, which again makes it quite bright. Also makes the sky quite bright as well. So it makes it a little bit trickier to be um, looking at constellations in the sky. And certainly if you were, uh, someone with a telescope and you wanted to look at fainter things in the sky, different nebulae or globular clusters or other star clusters, having a bright moon out is sort of less than ideal for viewing the sky. So a lot of times astronomers, we don't like having a nice bright moon in the sky. It's nice if you don't have tel a telescope or you don't have binoculars, but if you do, it kind of gets in the way. But fortunately, we are uh, focused on the moon tonight. And uh, uh, Mike, are we ready to take a look at the moon, you think? Yeah, I'm trying to uh, zoom in a little bit here, Toshi. All right, so we'll go ahead and, and we'll, uh, we'll switch over to our telescopic view of the moon and Mike's getting it uh, kind of centered and he'll get it uh, refocused here. But again, quite bright uh, in the sky here. And, uh, but we can already see some of those uh, features like the Maria, those darker areas and some of those craters. We've got a beautiful crater that's kind of right in the middle of one of the Maria. Mike's got it almost centered just a little bit off center there. And uh, Mike, you're better at lunar geography or selenography as they call it from Selene for the moon and uh, ography for like geography. But uh, Mike, you're better at that than I am. So that bright crater that's right in the middle of all the Maria there, uh, which crater is that? Let's see here, Toshi. I think you're talking about Copernicus. Yes, Copernicus. Let's see if I can, um, can get a little bit closer here. I'm a little bit of trouble. Oh, there we go. That's a little better. Okay, let's see if I can get it in the middle here. Um, yeah, Copernicus is, is nice because, again, it's, it's a bright crater that shows up right in the middle of uh, Samaria. So it's usually pretty easy to pick out there. And uh, Copernicus, of course, was a famous scientist. And most of the crater... Uh, craters on the moon, they're named after various scientists from throughout history. Uh, and Copernicus, Copernicus, of course, uh, has his own claim to fame. Now, Toshi, um, there are a few different features that we're going to see tonight. You've already spoken about a few of them. Um, we're, we're seeing lots of craters. Those are usually named by a philosopher or scientist um, surname. And um, there are a lot of other features that we're going to be seeing associated with craters are rays. And I don't know if um, the viewers, if you look carefully there, if you see that- Oh, let me switch back. I had switched, I'd switched over to our slide where we talk about the different uh, feature 
uh, names here, but we do have craters okay. and we have rays. Um, but yeah, let, let's, let me go back to Stellarium here so that we can take a look at the, or not Stellarium, your telescope view to see uh, the rays that you're talking about here. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Right. So you saw what some of the, the names in Latin are of the features that we're going to be seeing. See, I want it to go this way. So there's Copernicus right in the middle there. And you can see the splash out or the, the ray system that is all over this crater. This crater is believed to be about 800, um, 800 million years old. So that's pretty old. Um, but the mares, uh, the darker regions are even older. Some of them between two and some even as much as 3 billion years old. And uh, scientists have done a lot of work trying to determine uh, the ages of some of these things just because people tend to be interested in that stuff. And um, they were able to take uh, some soil samples from some of the, uh, not only the uh, manned missions, but also the, um, the ones that, uh, that at least I remember about the same time the Russians were landing on uh, the moon and taking robotically um, material back to earth. So there's a great deal of, um, Oops, having some trouble there. Let's see if I can get a little closer. And let me also see if I can do a little bit on the focus too. It's a little blurry, eh, Toshi? Yeah, and the, those those rays that you're talking about, those are they kind of uh, imagine for for a moment, everybody, that you have a large rock that's coming in and it slams into the moon. So just like dropping a pebble in a pool of water, you get some splash out. Um, well, if instead of being a uh, liquid like water, if it was uh, gr a solid ground that got liquefied and that splash out happens, then that splash out would, would emanate from the crater and we would see that as rays. And there's sort of a science experiment that sometimes uh, typically I've done it with elementary school students where you take some uh, a bed of flowers. So you take a container, flat container, uh, and you put some flour in it. And then you cover it with some cocoa powder. So you have a different color on the top. And if you drop a marble or a small rock, you can make your own crater. Uh, and what you'll see is that some of the flour from the bottom gets ejected and will fall on top of the cocoa powder that you've made out. So you can make your own sort of cratering experiment and form these rays yourself. And they're a result, again, of impacts happening, uh, in this case, on the moon. Um. One of the things we haven't mentioned, Toshi, I don't think unless I missed it, is that um, people can see, and if you've been to some of our shows previously, we see this all the time when we look at the moon with a small telescope from Earth, um, we see the scintillation or the sort of the waviness. It looks like we're viewing underwater. That's not anything on the moon that's caused by an effect of the Earth's atmosphere, which the Earth's atmosphere is constantly moving around, being heated, and the air rising, and then cooled as it rises up and gets further away from the, the uh, radiating ground, and then finally sinks back down. So it's constantly moving around, and that's sort of why it looks so bubbly. Can't do too much that from about that when we're viewing from uh, the Earth. Although scientists have some clever ways of uh, um, of sort of nullifying that effect sometimes so that they can get uh, some work done with earthbound telescopes as well. Um, yeah, there are ways of getting around that, that scintillation. Um, it is sort of bothersome because again, when you're looking at things, again, the light from whatever you're looking at, it gets distorted as it passes through our atmosphere. Uh, and so it can make things look kind of wavy. Uh, it's the very reason why people wanted to start putting telescopes up into space to get above our atmosphere. And as I've probably mentioned on several uh, previous of our missions, because I, I mentioned it quite often, uh, observing would be a lot simpler if we could just get rid of that pesky atmosphere uh, that I have. <laughs> Mike, I know you right. like having an atmosphere, but you know it really does get in the way of these I observations. So. Don't wish, to, be careful what you wish for, Toshi. <laughs> It could be a problem. But I, I'm realizing that just almost immediately below um, Copernicus there is another crater that's even got a more amazing system of rays, and that's the one called Tycho. And I'll see if you can, uh, if the folks 
who are viewing can see if they can figure out maybe which one they think it is. It's a bright crater, and then it's got streaks coming out of it, the, the ray system. And I'll zoom in on that now. Let me move it to the center. Yeah, and Tico is a very, very large crater. It's, uh, I'll just give a clue that it is not on any of the Mare, uh, the Mare. Oh, little I, plane just Did you just see that? That was there. a plane that just happened to go by. Very exciting <laughs> there. That's how you know we're live. Um, <laughs> or, or at least we're into special effects. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so Mike's got it zoomed in on Tico crater there, uh, which- you see uh, one great big ray emanating out across the dark area there. It's one of the rays of Tico, but they stretch an amazing distance away from the crater. So you can imagine how much energy was released when this, when this piece of material rock slammed into the surface of the moon. It just threw stuff every, every which way. Let's see if I can get it back here. Yeah. Can and this you is see? A, this is a um, uh, crater that, you know, if you're just looking at the moon, just with your eyes, uh, looking at the moon in the sky, it's sort of on the lower uh, part of the moon. And uh, it's even fairly obvious to the eye. And that's mainly because you're not seeing the, so much the crater itself, but all of the ejecta or all of the stuff that got ejected from the impact that, got, that settled around it. So it looks like a very large, bright thing. The crater itself, a little bit smaller, um, but the surrounding area is very, very bright. Uh, and that's because it was all that stuff that was underneath the moon that got thrown up and made sort of a very large, bright area. And now that you pan a little bit off to the side, again, we can see the rays and that contrast with some of the darker Maria uh, underneath there. Yeah, it's, it's an amazing, let's see if we can zoom back here and see if we can see the extent to which those, those rays extend. I mean, wait a minute, I've got a focus problem. Let me see if I can fix that. Yeah, and just so everyone knows here, when Mike is, has the, uh, when he's pulled out uh, to get as wide a view of the moon as, as possible, um, because of the optics in his telescope, the uh, image is flipped. So the top of Mike's uh, image through his telescope is the bottom of the moon if you're looking at it in the sky just with your eyes. Good point, Toshi, and I forgot to mention that. So both Copernicus and Tycho, the two ones that we've looked at so far, would be more on the left side of the moon if you were looking um, using a pair of binoculars. Did I get that right, Toshi? Yes, I think so. I think so, yeah, because so, it's flipped. You can see a bunch of the mare. I wanted to show you a particular one. Um, the one that's in close to the middle, let's see if I can put it right in the middle there. That one's called the, uh, the Sea of Tranquility. That's where uh, Apollo 11 landed, right, Toshi? Yeah, that was the very first mission that landed people on the moon humans. So that's where Neil Armstrong uh, left his famous, the most famous footprint in the history of footprints. Uh, that's uh, uh, right on that uh, Sea of Tranquility. Uh, so, the, so that middle, the darkest one, that's almost right in the middle of our view here. The other one that's just above it, let's see if I can move it to be into center. That's Mare Serenitatis, the Sea of Serenity. Oh, come back. <laughs> let's start focus a bit here. But, uh... The camera tries to do its own thing and it's not always correct. Oops. So while you're, wanted... you're doing that, there, uh, there is a question that came in through the, uh, through the comments on, on YouTube, oh, okay. which we are monitoring. So if people have questions, go ahead and put them in the YouTube comments and we'll see if we can address some of them here. But uh, there is a question about uh, any tips to find constellations in the night sky. Um, that program that I was using to show as I was panning around the sky, Stellarium, that's available free. Um, on the web and there's a web version so you don't have to download anything or you can download your own copy of the software and that runs on Windows or Mac or Linux, uh, just about any operating system. So that's a great way to learn the sky. Um, but another great way if I could uh, be so inclined is to visit a planetarium. Of course, we're not open at the De Anza College Planetarium at the moment, but um, we're hoping to do that uh, hopefully sooner rather than later, um, but to come visit a planetarium. But uh, Learning in the Sky, there's lots of books out there, but I think one of the best tools that we have in 2021 is to go ahead and 
um, either visit a planetarium or to just play around with the Stellarium software. Again, the web version does just fine, so you don't have to download anything if you don't want to, but Stellarium uh, is a great way to learn the constellations in the sky. And we're seeing an example of um, more Earth atmosphere, a cloud just, went, no, you know what that is? That's a vapor trail. I can see it much easier <laughs> from where I am. It just went across the moon there. So no weather problems, that's good. That I saw a little the bird there, go by too. But... Oh, you did you? Okay. Um, that, that mare, that uh, basalt region we were talking about, uh, we didn't say basalt, but those dark regions are typically rich in basalt. That was one of the things that they discovered uh, when they did, um, they analyzed the specimens that they came back from, um, from Apollo. Anyway, that circular one is called Mare Crisium, and it's the Sea of Crisis. Now, the reason I'm pointing that one out is normally that is much closer to the edge of the moon than you see it tonight. And due to an effect, um, gravity, there are three bodies that are involved in the controlling sort of, of what happens with the moon. The gravity of the earth, the moon and the sun are involved. And the moon's motion is very, is pretty complex and it was very difficult. Even for um, one of my favorite scientists, Isaac Newton used to say that his head never ached unless he was doing problems about the motion of the moon. Whether that's an apocryphal story, I don't know or not, but I've heard that before. Anyway, the stuff that's beyond Mare Crisium there is a mare called Mare Marginis, which literally means sea in the margin. And it turns out that this very complex motion of the moon, an aspect called libration, L-I-B-R-A-T-I-O-N, libration, is responsible for sort of rocking our view a little bit. And instead of just seeing only a half of the moon, as um, most people know, um, that's usually what we see is the same, the same side constantly. We see more than 50%. We actually see about 59%. Um, and so because of that motion, sometimes you can see Mare Marginis and sometimes you can't. But for the most part, the view changes uh, not, not very much, like I said, just by a few percent. Can you uh, fill in any details I missed on that, Tosha? Yeah, so again, just to recap the sort of the dark circular region that's almost right in the middle of our view, it's just sort of below center uh, at the moment, but um, that's Mare uh, Crisium. And just to the left of our view is what we're seeing as Mare Mar Marginis. Uh, and that again is that darker area, it's right on the very edge. And to help illustrate that a little bit better, let me go ahead and temporarily switch away from the telescope view to a map of the moon, uh, which you can download for yourself. This is available from NASA, um, from the uh, from the Science Visualization uh, Center, that's um, our studio, Science Visualization Studio, that's based out of the Goddard Space Flight Center uh, of NASA. And so this is a map that is particular for tonight, in particular for eight o'clock tonight, and we happen to be right at eight o'clock here. Um, but the part of the sky that, or the part of the moon that Mike was focused on, again, you can see the labels here. We've got Mare Crisium, and just right again on the very edge, this part here that I'm circling here, Mare Marginis, that's the one that normally can't be seen or often can't be seen because normally, let me back away from the view here, um, the, the part of the moon that we see, we might only see up to about here, where I'm tracing with my cursor here, but because the moon is sort of rocking back and forth a little bit, sort of from side to side, tonight we get to see a little bit more of this left side here, which is why we can see Mar Marginus. Um, Marginus. And let me go ahead and switch to a view where we can see both uh, the view that I've got on the map, as well as uh, Mike's view. And this is a pretty close match. In fact, I think, oh, actually, let me zoom in a little bit more. Uh, let me see if I can match your view a little bit better. Uh, Mike here. I think we've got something that's kind of similar to this here. So again, we've got Mare Crisium, and then just to the left there, Mare Marginis uh, over here. Um, and that again, right on the margins, can't always see it, but sometimes you can if it happens to be right. Um, and if I could uh, go back to the view of my map here just for a moment, just so that everyone knows, 
Um, this map, again, it's good for this particular date uh, at uh, 3 a.m. universal time, which makes it 8 o'clock tonight. But you can download uh, a map of the moon and it'll have correct phase information and shadow information. So we look over a little preview for what we're, I think we're about to look at in just a little bit. Some of these uh, craters that are on the terminator on the edge, that boundary between the light side of the moon and the dark side of the moon and the way it's shadowed here. NASA has gone in and made these maps so that these shadows are accurate to what you would see at this particular time uh, that you've set. And you can download a map for every hour of every day of the entire year uh, for 2021. And NASA, they put out these maps every single year. So um, we'll put the link to that in the, um, in the comments and in the description of this video once it's posted. Um, but you can download your own map. And so you can get, have a little handy map here that if you're looking at the moon, either just with your eyes or with binoculars or a telescope, you can take a look and it'll have major uh, craters uh, and mare uh, marked so that you know what you're looking at. Um, also has a landing sites for say Apollo uh, 12 and Apollo 14. We mentioned Apollo uh, 16 earlier um, and that was um, that we're about to celebrate uh, the anniversary of that one here. And I thought I saw where Apollo 16 was landed uh, before, but I'll have to take a look. I don't want to waste our time looking at that right now on this side here. But uh, this is a highly detailed uh, map here uh, that shows you, again, the exact lighting that the moon would have on any given, on any given hour, on any given day uh, throughout the year. So a fantastic resource from NASA that everybody can check out here. But uh, looks like people well, want to be taking a look at the moon some more. So I'm gonna go ahead and switch back to our, our view of the uh, moon through your telescope, Mike. Well, let's go ahead and um, sort of walk up the, uh, that line between night and day on the moon that we call the Terminator. Toshi, I don't think we had said that before. Uh, the Terminator is the line that sort of separates the bright part from the dim part. On a night like tonight, where it's a gibbous moon, and it's not like a half moon, um, it's a little trickier to be able to see good contrast. But um, we can see some really nice contrast on some of these features here. Let's go ahead and let me move it just a little bit. There's a, there's a dark area on Mare region called Mare Humorum. That's the sea of moisture. Remember all of these things people thought the dark parts were, uh, were water liquid water because it was there on the earth they figured it was probably there on the moon as well yeah and back in but, the day telescopes they weren't very powerful they weren't very strong so uh, and a lot of these features i think were probably named before we had telescopes so people were just seeing these darker areas on the moon that you can see with your naked eye so again the assumption was that they were like big seas or oceans that were on the moon uh, there. And, and while you're so, zooming in and adjusting the focus a little bit there, my couple of questions that have come in uh, through the uh, through the comments here. Uh, is uh -huh. Copernicus the largest lunar crater? Um, and how large was the asteroid that created it bigger than Chicxulub? Um, so, I believe uh, that the largest one is, uh, is um, the one down at the bottom. It's, um, it's, it's near, Clavius. <laughs> Clavius is the biggest one across. In terms of, of the seas, um, that great big one um, that's um, the Sea of Rains or Mare Imbrium, that's one of the largest. There's one called Oceanus Procellarum, that's the largest. But craters, I think, uh, I don't know that there's any bigger ones than uh, Clavius. That's something about 150 kilometers. Is that sort of the information that you know, Toshi? Yeah, that sounds about right to me, that Clavius is about 150 kilometers. The Chicxulub crater, uh, if I recall correctly, is about 300 kilometers, so not quite as big as that one, um, but you know, sizable for the moon, but not quite as big as that crater uh, at Chicxulub there. Um, one more question so about how many craters are there on the moon? And gosh, <laughs> I don't have an answer for that. I was hoping you do, Mike. Uh, a zillion and six, Toshi. Always good no, to be just specific. kidding. Um, <laughs> Quite a few of them. I mean, these are caused, we haven't really talked, to, I guess we talked a little bit about it, by um, solid material um, hitting the surface of the moon at in, insane velocities. And um, 
you can see, for example, a very cool crater by the name of Gassendi, which is on the uh, upper part of um, the Mare Humorum there. And Gassendi has got some nice, a nice set of a nice rim there. And it's also got a nice, what they call a central peak. Um, and the central peak is, is created when all the energy from the impact is transferred to the lunar material, it melts it in some cases and causes a flow. Um, it's very interesting. Uh, it's interesting to read about uh, just on Wikipedia even. There's uh, some good articles about how the uh, those central peaks are created. Yeah, and one analogy that I like to tell people about that is um, you may have seen like uh, high resolution photos of when someone drops a pebble again in a pond and uh, people who are very good photographers, much better than I am, uh, they'll take a picture of this, the moment after that happens. And there's a little bloop of water that pops up uh, after the pebble has dropped uh, into the water. Um, well, again, imagine instead of water, you had solid rock, but it became liquefied, it became molten because of the impact. So you get that same thing where you get a gloop of the liquefied uh, surface that pops up. And then when it falls back down, it solidifies and makes this little mountain. And we can see an example of that with, the, again, this Gassendi crater that we're looking at. It's about centered in the view through your scope here, Mike. And, and that central peak uh, is a result of that sort of thing where, again, the liquid being or the surface being liquefied, popping up uh, a little bit and then sort of settling back down and forming a little mountain right inside of the crater there. And again, that's what we call a central peak. Not every crater has it, but a lot of the larger craters uh, do. And going back to that question of how many craters are there on the moon, uh, you know, speaking a little bit more seriously, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of craters. And uh, there are new craters being formed. There are still things hitting the moon. Most of the large things, there aren't large things hitting the moon anymore, but there are small things hitting the moon still. Uh, and there are even what we call micrometeorites, uh, which are impacting on the surface of the moon as well. So there are new craters being formed all the time. But as far as the sort of the larger ones, I uh, I would have to look that up, but certainly uh, hundreds and hundreds. Well, Toshi, it turns there. out that um, as we've been talking about the creation of those Mare regions, they are created by incredibly large impacts making craters that are way bigger than the craters that we normally see. So if you counted the Mare as originally being craters, those would have to be uh, the big, the one, the real record holders. You know what I'm saying? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So a lot of times in my own mind, I, I keep the Mare uh, sort of separate uh, from craters. But uh, but you are correct that originally um, they were formed yeah. by very large things impacting, and that's why so many of the Mare areas. I mean, you can just sort of see uh, if you imagine uh, again. We're looking at Gassendi Crater, right? It's sort of near the bottom of our view now. But you can kind of see if you imagine that crater being at sort of the six o'clock position on a clock going all the way around. There's a pretty circular definition going around there uh, with Cassendi being right at six o'clock, got another sort of crater system right at 12 o'clock uh, there. And uh, again, but it, it traces out sort of a circular path just where the Mare is, where it's mostly smoothed over because it liquefied the surface so much that again, it made it like a whole sea of lava uh, that flowed on the surface, smoothed everything out, covered up any older craters, and any craters that we see on top of them, like Gassendi, like we're looking at here, are craters that were, uh, were formed much later. And again, that's how astronomers can uh, age these different impacts as they look at see what's layered on top of what. And of course, the oldest layer would be on the bottom, newer things being on top. So um, I guess what you're saying then, Toshi, there's that little crater that's on top of Gassendi we would say that little one is a younger crater, yes? Yes, and, and in our view, again, because it's flipped around, it's on the bottom, but yes, oh, that okay. little crater that's right at the, the bottom of Gassendi there, that would be a, a younger crater. And that only makes sense because it's a crater that we can see has formed on top of the larger Gassendi crater there. Okay, well, let's, let's go ahead and uh, finish up our walk around the Terminator here. See what else we can see. There's a... Uh, Oops, let me go this way. There's another crater with a cool ray system that I'm bringing into the middle here. And that one is known as Kepler. 
And uh, if any of you know anything about astronomy, you might have heard of Kepler before. Kepler was the one who was the first scientist or semi-scientist to be able to figure out um, why it was that the planets moved in the peculiar ways that uh, they were noted to move. But some nice rays there, you know, not quite the scale of Tycho, for example. Yeah, and I wonder, Mike, if you could adjust your focus, maybe just a, a tiny bit there. It could be the atmosphere as well, but Kepler is the one there that has um, sort of a nice, uh, there's a nice dark shadow in there, which tells us that it's a uh, sort of a deeper crater than some in the surrounding craters uh, there. But again, that's uh, showing up. Let's see if I can get it on my uh, SVS map as well. I'm not sure it's labeled uh, quite as nicely. Um, it may not be. Yeah, I don't see it quite as nicely. So maybe we'll, we'll skip that one uh, for now, but. Um, Let's see what else we've got. Um, we need to also, we, I wanna look at uh, Jupiter here. I've got uh, some clouds here, Toshi. So uh, I'm not sure. It looks still like it's gonna be okay. They seem to be drifting towards the, the east and um, Jupiter and Saturn are to the west of the moon. So I think we'll be all right. Well, let me just go up a little bit higher here. See if we can, this is a complex of craters <clears throat> and mountains called Prins. And actually you can't really see the, the crater structure just because not enough of it is lit. But when, um, when features get on this, this uh, Terminator line, uh, a lot of times you can see so much detail that it makes it difficult to identify the character of what you're looking at. Yeah, and that's why, again, typically, uh, if you want to be observing the moon, looking at uh, the moon when it's a full moon or something near a full moon is usually less desirable because you get less of these shadows. So the moon is actually more interesting uh, when you're looking sort of right along this terminator where we're looking now where you can see shadows in the craters, shadows cast by the mountains, shadows that fall into the valleys. Uh, there's just a lot more definition and it gives the moon a real three-dimensional look to it instead of just being this flat thing uh, that you're looking at. If you, if, we, if you remember when we're looking just at the Maria, it looked fairly flat. Um, but when we're looking again, close to where the Terminator is, and we can see there's several craters here. There's a couple near the top and, and one sort of uh, to the right of center. And this whole sort of mountainous structure that you're uh, panning down to right now, Mike, we see the shadows. And again, it gives it a real three-dimensional characteristic to it uh, that you can, that changes depending on how the moon is illuminated. So if you were to look, uh, maybe not so much tomorrow night, but you know, in a few nights when the light has changed a little bit, the shadows have changed, uh, then the, uh, the craters, they look different. They're not, uh, they might have deeper shadows or less deep shadows, um, all of that changes. So the moon is very interesting to look at from uh, night to night, even at the same areas because they're illuminated differently depending on exactly what phase the moon is in. Well, that, um, that little uh, crescent shape there that kind of looks a little bit like the Monterey Bay, just a little bit, that ocean that's right by the huge one down below, um, that, is, um, that is Mare Imbrium, or the Sea of Rains. But that little, little it's, it's actually called a bay, Pallas Iridium. Pallas Iridium means in, that's a, the Latin for Bay of Rainbows. I don't know where they saw the rainbow part, but the bay, I can imagine, they, looks like uh, a little inlet uh, of a larger ocean. Let's see if I can get up to the very top here. That looks like there's some interesting stuff right on the edge. Oh, the one that's in the middle there is uh, one called Plato. We haven't had too many um, philosophers, but Plato is, let's see if I can get a little bit. You can also see that that one is filled with lava because it's so smooth. This is ancient lava though, right? This is like two or three billion year ago formed lava. All right, well, we need to move on here. Um, get to see a bit of planets here. Let's see if I can finish this up here at the top. Some nice stuff going on there. All right. Okay, Toshi. Well, um, what about if we take a look at uh, Jupiter is right close by? Would you like me to try for that? 
Yeah, why don't you go ahead and, and do that and, and we'll switch over to, to view here again. We want to thank everyone uh, for watching this evening and, and uh, hope you enjoyed that tour of the moon. Again, we have some a uh, little bit of time as Mike switches things over to uh, answer some questions. I do see a question in the chat here about a nice telescope for beginners. Uh, and my advice for people, if you want to get your very first telescope, is to get a good set of binoculars, actually, as your very first telescope. Telescopes can be very finicky, um, and sometimes there's a lot to align, and sometimes there's computers hooked up to them, so that you have to figure out how to work that. Um, so if you're just starting out, I would really recommend getting a good pair of binoculars. Um, 10 by 50s are sort of the um, standard uh, astronomy binoculars there, so that means sort of a, a a, uh, 10 times magnification in a 50 degree uh, field of view. Um, but uh, any binoculars that you have lying around, uh, if you already have binoculars and they're, they're usually fairly inexpensive, if you want to get a pair of binoculars, certainly more uh, or certainly less expensive than a full telescope. But binoculars are a great way just to get your weight, get, just for you to get to know your way around the sky. So to learn constellations, learn where things are. And one very important skill for stargazers is to figure out how to do what we call star hopping. And that's when you focus in on a star where that you know the location of, and then go from that star and know that, okay, I have to go a little bit northward from that star. And then I have to look a little bit more uh, towards the left or towards the east, whichever it may be, that sort of thing. And you might have to sort of start with a place that you know, a star that you know exists, and then you have to sort of hop over to a few other stars before you get to the actual object that you want to take a look at. So again, the very best uh, uh, telescope to start off with would be a pair of binoculars. Once you get comfortable with the sky and you know where things are and you can find a few uh, maybe star clusters or nebulae, clouds of gas, other faint fuzzies, as sometimes they're called in the sky. Once you can find them with binoculars, then you can kind of graduate with telescopes. There's all sorts of resources to figure out what to do. Um, uh, again, sort of some general advice about getting a telescope is the best telescope is going to be the one that you are actually going to use. Sometimes people want to you know, get out and get a big telescope because the bigger the telescope, the more light you can produce, the better your images and that sort of thing. But if you've got a telescope and it's got you know, a 16 inch mirror in it and it's this gigantic thing that you, probably you, right, are going to have to haul in and out of your car to move it around, you're probably not going to use it very much. So be thinking about that as well. How often are you going to use it? How much does it weigh for you to carry around? Um, you want to be thinking of those things as well, um, not just the performance of the telescope itself, but how to get it around, um, because you will have to take it, you know, maybe from your garage uh, to your car and then drive out somewhere. Even if you're just setting it up outside, uh, on your patio or something like that, you know, you're going to want to make sure that it's not some huge hulking thing that is just a, just too much of a chore to pull out and to uh, put out on your back deck or whatever it may be. You want something that's uh, fairly easy to set up um, because telescopes can be very complicated. Things get very complicated very quickly. So I would start with something simple, uh, but I would avoid um, for sure um, you know, I know the holiday season is coming up and, you know, department stores, the department store telescope is usually the worst telescope out there. Um, usually on the box, there's a lot of promises about, oh, it magnifies 200 times and you get a view. Usually the picture they put on the box is something that they took from like Hubble or something. It's not an actual picture that was taken with that telescope. So beware of the um of the department store telescope, you wanna see if you can find someplace that specializes in telescopes. Um, there's a local company called Orion Telescope and they're not a sponsor of this program by any means. Um, they Unfortunately, they had a shop in Cupertino, but they closed that shop just recently. I, I just learned that, um, but they do have a, a store in, uh, I believe it's in Watsonville. Um, and there's a few other reputable uh, places where you can get telescopes online and you can check out the specs. Um, but make sure that you go someplace that specializes in telescopes and isn't just something that gets in the corner that, you know, they, you know, a place like a department store, like a Macy's or, you know, is just going to stock one and they might sell a few, but no one on the, on the uh, floor is going to know anything about the telescopes. And you want to go someplace where you can specialize. There's another place called uh, Scope City in San Francisco that I've done shopping at before. Um, they usually have a pretty good selection. And again, lots of places online, but if you wanna get someplace in person, Scope City is the one that comes to mind. Uh, again, that's up in San Francisco. Toshi, uh, I've, got, yeah. uh, I've got Jupiter in the scope here. And I'd like to ask um, our guests if they can tell us 
how many of how many of the moons that we're seeing? All right, so I've got a view of all of us. We see your arm um, there, but uh, yeah, so we've got uh, Jupiter there in the view and some moons. So Jupiter is going to be that bright one uh, there, and then we've got a few moons. Uh, so and let's see. I'm going to zoom in so you can look carefully. This was a trick question because one of them is actually two moons very close together at this time. Again, you can go ahead and put your guesses in the chat there if you haven't already. Oops. That's maybe a little too much zoom for what we're doing here tonight, Mike. But well, yeah. if it would if it wouldn't try and second guess me with the focus. <laughs> so those two are Europa and EO. Europa on the left, EO on the right. And they'll be even closer around 8.30. So that's only 10 minutes away. Um, yeah, so very close together. The... They're, oh, I was go ahead, say, they're not going to hit each other. So it is safe. <laughs> but if you look um, to the right of EO and Europa, the next one out there is Ganymede. And again, these are the Galilean satellites. Galileo was the first to, to see them and had a hand in naming them as well. And if I zoom back out a little more here, you can see Callisto. Yeah, so Galileo was able to spot four moons, and that's why we call them the Galilean moons um, today. So here we see what looks like three, but again, the, that uh, moon that's closest to Jupiter. Again, Jupiter is the big bright thing that we're looking at. Again, unfortunately, the details washed out uh, for our broadcast here. Um, but we've got Io or, and, or Io and Europa right next to each other, followed by Ganymede. And then Callisto is right at the very, very top of the view that we see there. And what I'm going to do, Mike, is I'm actually going to um, switch over to Stellarium so that we can uh, take a look. And uh, let me see if I can go ahead and pull that up here. So we're looking in okay. Stellarium. Here we can we can see the bands of Jupiter. That's just sort of on um, the beauty of Stellarium here. I mean, back away just a little bit more. But again, we've got Jupiter, and then we've got two moons here, and then we've got a third moon and a fourth moon. Just by pure coincidence tonight, uh, they happen to be all on one side of Jupiter. That's not always the case. Um, they do go around Jupiter. And this was part of the evidence that Galileo discovered that there were these things, these four uh, bright objects that he saw, they were almost in a nice straight line around Jupiter. When he looked on one night, they were in one position. But if I can use the magic of Stellarium to skip ahead a whole day into the future, you'll notice that the moons are all in different positions. And let me see if I can pull up um, the names of the moons so that we can see them. We've got Callisto, Ganymede, Europa, Jupiter, and then Io here. And if we go back to today, all right, this is, they're all on one side here. So what Galileo noticed was that they were moving around here. And that was sort of some evidence for Galileo that at the time, of course, the conventional wisdom was that everything orbited Earth. Everyone went around Earth. But here, Galileo, he tracked these moons. Um, he actually called them stars initially. But he, he tracked these little stars that stayed in a line around Jupiter. They're always in a line around Jupiter. But sometimes they were all on one side sometimes on the other side, sometimes there were two on one side, sometimes two on the other, um, but they were moving around, but there are always four, or, or just about always four, they're always in a line. And so he reasoned that they were moving around Jupiter. And that was a real challenge to, again, the wisdom of the day that everything is going around Earth. Well, here was clear evidence of things that were not going around Earth here. Um, but uh, I think that's enough of Stellarium. Let's go ahead and switch back to the, the real view through your telescope at the moment. And uh, again, the orientation is different here, but I can definitely see two distinct moons uh, there now that uh, we all know what to look for, that there looks like there's a little bit of a bar between those, those uh, the set of moons that's closest to Jupiter. And that's because there are two distinct moons uh, there. And then we've got the, the others. Uh, Let me try and zoom in on that, Toshi, just so we can see the I mean, it, we risk the focus here. Yeah. But you can tell there's two there. It's a little bit, yeah. That, that spacing between the moons there, uh, a little bit more obvious. Again, a lot more noise uh, in the signal that we're broadcasting here. But hopefully you can tell everybody that there are two 
I mean, let's face it, they do look kind of blobby. There are two distinct blobs <laughs> there instead of just a single blob like the other moons there. Jupiter is the biggest blob, uh, very bright, but then two, two blobs very, very close to each other there. Um, and while, uh, while we're sort of playing with the focus there and playing with our view here, there is a question again that came in through the, uh, the YouTube uh, comments here about um, that someone, Don Wood, tried to line up their camera with uh, the telescope, but it didn't work. How did you get your camera to work with yours? Um, so I will say, and Mike, you can jump in as well, that Mike is using his phone uh, that's hooked up to his scope. And what he did was he got a special uh, phone holder that's meant to, it's designed to attach to uh, the harness or the eyepiece uh, that you're looking at. And let me uh, switch over to, now that you're in camera view, Mike will take a look at you there, but maybe you can, if you wanna add a little bit more to that holder. I always forget the name of that holder. Um, it's called an XYZ. It's made by a company called Celestron, which is uh, very famous for making uh, telescope, amateur telescope equipment. And, um, and it, it works pretty well. Um, there are people sometimes, even uh, people who don't do this very often, bring their phone up and they hold it over the eyepiece and they're able to take pictures. And that never works for me. So I had to go and get uh, I think it was 60, 70 bucks, something like that for this uh, thing called NextYZ. It's basically a way that you can control in three dimensions in, in and out as well as X and Y. And um, what that allows you to do is to hold it fairly steady. Now, of course, there's still, you notice that it wasn't completely steady um, even at any point. Um, it depends on the magnification. The more magnification you have, the less steady it will seem because very small vibrations get um, magnified. Um, but anyway, it's another way to, uh, to it, I've gotten some decent pictures with it. Um, certainly the brighter ones better. Um, some telescopes are better at getting very faint images and um, maybe at some point we'll be able to do a show. Um, with one of those and that, uh, that holder, again, is for any phone. Um, I know Mike has an iPhone, but it works with any phone. It's a pretty good design for the holder. Um, and that those, that's available on Amazon. Um, so you can, you can get it there, or um, there's probably some other places as well. Um, I do know, just looking at the clock, that we are running a little bit short on time. So a couple of things that uh, I do want to mention here. Um, still related to the moon, um, but not related to anything uh, tonight here, is that there is next month a near total lunar eclipse happening. And that's happening for us here on the West Coast of, uh, of the country here. Um, that's happening the night of the 18th, and it continues on into the morning of the 19th of November. And as I recall, that's a Thursday night, Friday morning. Um, it starts, get, the moon will start to get eclipsed about 11.19 p.m. That'll be Pacific Standard Time by that time. And uh, the shadow of Earth is going to fall on the moon and almost cover the whole moon there. The, it's about 97% coverage of the total of moon, the moon's diameter. So there's a little bit, 3% that won't get covered. Um, but the maximum coverage will happen at 1.03 a.m. Uh, that'll be in the morning of the 19th. And then the whole thing will be over at 2.47 in the morning. So there's a lot of details at a website that I like to go to called uh, Time and Date. Dot com, so you can check that out there. This is, again, just a simulated view. Um, but these uh, lunar eclipses, they happen every now and then. Um, this one, again, near total, just about as total as you can get without actually being total. That's happening next month. Uh, and then uh, we will get a total lunar eclipse in May of next year. And that happens at uh, right in the evening, just as the moon is rising, uh, the moon will be moving into the eclipse there. Um, so that's coming up as well. Um, but uh, I think that's just about it. So do check out uh, the lunar eclipse ca uh, happening next uh, month. But uh, Mike, did I miss anything? Any last thoughts? I don't think so, Toshi. I'd just like to thank everybody for tuning in tonight. Um, Toshi and I love to do these programs and, uh, and uh, to have people come and watch uh, for extended periods is terrific. And we appreciate that. And uh, we'll keep trying to give you more stuff. All right. Well, again, thanks to uh, you, Mike, setting up in, in the cold 
and the uh, <laughs> with your telescope and, and getting us those fantastic views of the moon. I think it worked out really nice uh, tonight. I know you and I were both a little bit concerned about how bright the moon was going to be, but I think it turned out yeah. quite well. We saw a lot of great features, a lot of great detail. Uh, so from all of us, the entire staff of the Planetarium at De Anza College, we'd like to thank everybody for joining us this evening. We hope you get a chance to look at the real moon, whether that's tonight or coming up or uh, certainly for the uh, total eclipse, total lunar eclipse that's happening next month. Hopefully you get to check a look, t- take a look at the moon. Uh, check out Stellarium if you want to learn a little bit more about, um, about constellations and finding your way around the sky. And we will see you for the next uh, star party that we're going to be hosting, which we will be hosting in uh, December here. So tune in for that and we will see you next time. So thanks a lot, everybody. Have a good night. Good night.